Kieran, thank you for coming in. Uh, nice to finally meet. It's been uh, lots of chats, but not actually meeting in, in person. So it's awesome to see you. Great to be here. Thank you. Just you know, for the audience, just talk us through how you ended up facing into startups. Yeah. So, I mean, my quick backstory, I call myself a virtual FD. So I am real and you can't touch me. Um, exactly. Yeah. The virtual bit is that I can be anywhere. So I live on the Isle of Wight and I can work with people who are I guess anywhere. So I've got clients work with businesses in Shoreditch, in London, in Brighton, Hampshire, Cheshire, New York, Singapore. And if you were on the island, I would say, and in Gurnard, which is a small town right. on the Isle of Wight. So the idea is that I used to be in the corporate space and I got a bit of fatigue being in, I say, surrounded by employees. And then when I was 35, I said, I just want to be surrounded by remarkable people. So I made that transition amazingly when my wife was nine months pregnant and we just moved house but I'd kind of thought about this a long time and then moved into a space where I basically just needed two or three businesses to be as busy or earning as much as I was in the corporate space yeah and then very quickly I just realized that there's an entire ecosystem of people who are starting up companies who are you know not financially qualified or financially educated maybe so there's sales or product or marketing or tech or ops. And I was like, I've got the skill set from a planning, reporting, structure, governance point of view, just really to glue into their business. And if I do in a certain way, I'll work with them through seed rounds, maybe through to an A round. And then there's, there may be just a natural conclusion, whether it's exit or full-time FD, which we can cover, or you know, the business fails. What's your typical client base at the moment then? You've obviously got a range of sectors, range of sizes. Talk us through the five or six or 10. How many do you have? Yeah, so sometimes a conversation will start with a CEO where they say, are you a specialist for a specific sector? And my, my default genuine answer is, um, so many of these issues are basically just, just cover every sector. So yeah. I work with businesses, for example, that could have angel investors, bootstrapped, owner-managed, VC capital. So instantly you've got just a different dynamic as to what needs to be done, for who, in what time frame. Um, Each will have a different milestone in mind for the next six, 12 months, depending on the... Some are self-driven, so owner-managed. Some are very, like when you bring in a VC, you've got to be ready for the, you know, the, the step up in governance, in reporting, in growth all those things that are important to closing an A round, but, but actually post the A round, yeah. you've got the money, are we delivering the plan? Yeah, so I mean, it's a mix. Tech is always personally of interest to me. Recurring revenues, recurring income is also, you know, a nice, a nice easier story. It's a great story to build. It's great to work with businesses that do have customers that come back time and time again. But yeah, travel, sports, leisure, you know, healthcare, prop tech, insure tech, data tech, you know, AI. You can see that there's so many things that still comes down to, do we know how well we're doing? Do we know where we're going? Have we got a clear view of the ownership of the business? And, you know, is the DNA of the business based on metrics and analytics rather than the old culture, which was, I'm just going to try and wing it or yeah. fly by the seat of my pants. I think, you know, it sounds, you know, when there's a, a co-founding relationship, maybe there's two and one's, growth-led marketing and sales and one's product-led tech or, or the actual product, um, they have to work on their blind spots to be the finance lead in the business to a certain point they can get away with it. But then maybe, is that most of the clients that you're supporting where you are that conduit for finance and strategy that maybe the, fa the founders don't have or don't have the time to focus on it? Yeah, I think the key word is structure. So you have a structured approach to growth. So you're working with people who want to grow, like have a real appetite. And when yeah. they get market product market fit, that's it. They just want to go. And I say, I joke, someone to win the Super Bowl, but they just have a big prize in mind. Yeah. And what's quite interesting is you just need to actually structure it. Like, so a, a forecast that's got drivers and that the drivers have some sort of anchor to reality. So as I joke, you know, a forecast is just a bunch of ifs. So it's like, so how good are your ifs? If the ifs are actually anchored in reality, the growth bit actually feels credible. And you can have other businesses that 
um, have, you know, they have a good sense of structure and they're very investable people, but they could just have, I would say, vanity stats. So how's your business doing? They'll just pull out the vanity stats. Buy Number that. of customers, 10 mil revenue. And I'm always in, instantly kind of thinking, profitable, not profitable, yeah. loss making, burning cash. And what you're trying to do is trying to help them engineer, what's the story when we sell the business? It's probably not the, the vanity stat that drives the quality. So we think the easiest way to value a business is based on a multiple of profits. I mean, that's the first thing you're trying to understand is if we've got 10 mil turnover, is that how the business will ultimately be valued? So we've got no profits. We've got to get to a point where we think we're creating value. And do you have a, a process when having those first conversations with the founder in terms of kicking the tires, dotting the I's, crossing the T's to understand how best you can help them? What, what are you trying to ascertain in those first couple of calls or meetings? Well, yeah, it's interesting because the, there's a lot of professionals will always say, I've been talking to this business for you know, four or five times and I'm still not quite sure if we're going to work together. And I think a, a lot of it actually is twofold. One is it should be pretty clear you know, on that first call, that first like, direct engagement, do they have a problem and can you fix the problem? And the way I kind of approach it with the flexibility of the portfolio is that you can... You can just, you, you're just trying to build a relationship. So it's not never a gig to say, you're gonna to have to invest in me 20 days a month to fix this problem. I can ask a simple question, which is what's the number one financial priority you've got right now today? Every business owner can answer that question. And I know if we fix that, there's gonna be another one tomorrow. Yeah, and yeah. It, well, not, maybe not tomorrow, but there's gonna be another one because finance is finance. You grow the business, there'll be a complexity, whether it's you know, cash flow or reporting or the next board meeting or the next something or share option scheme, the business does grow. So plugging in this kind of financial structure sooner on a flexible basis, I'm just after the relationship. And if we can build a, a good relationship together, yeah, you kind of feel that your payback, your impact is on, in a nice way, it's not just based on one thing, it could be helping to grow revenues, push for profits, improve cash flow, or grow the value of the business. It's not just a one trick pony. The yeah. finance piece is actually, is to maybe just help sort one of those things out, but actually all four start to really kind of come fresh in. From a CEO's point of view, they start off thinking they just had one problem they needed to fix. And they realize this is actually just a, a recurring piece. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we see that's incredibly useful for uh, a founder going into that series A round is having that portfolio resource that knows the business and prepares it for that A round ahead of schedule. And the flexibility you're talking about um, is almost project led with that continual touch base once a month type process. I don't know if you find the same where you've got problem one, which is building the financial model or the forecast, yeah. which might be two weeks of reasonably solid work. But then from there, you've solved that immediate requirement and it can drop down to the board meeting once a month. Um, and then in three months time, it might be, do we invest in a second location in Lisbon or do we develop this product? Do we spend this money on R&D? Do we hire this marketing exec? Um, and those little projects go through the life cycle of a pre-seed seed to series A business. Yep. And then when you're at that stage, where it gets a bit more serious and investors are expecting a bit more, there's already somebody that knows the business for two, three years, yeah. but may have only actually worked 30 days with them. Well, it's funny because I describe myself, and I say this quite openly with everyone I work with, you know, I'm your full-time FD in that I, I don't just turn up on a Monday and I'll see you next month. So that, that kind of role, there may be FDs out there that, that have that behavior, but the businesses I work with, everything is non-linear. And I think post COVID, it has changed for the better how people work their workflows. So not just the CEO, but actually their teams, where pe how, how contactable people are. Every business to me feels that there's a, an element is linear, like the service or product they provide, but a huge amount of how the team works is very, not unstructured, but it's everyone's reachable a lot more often. People are in less meetings, they're commuting less, they're between meetings less. 
they're more reachable. You can actually just nudge somebody on WhatsApp and say, they've got two minutes. Mm -hmm. So back to your point about forecasting, it shouldn't feel like a two week block of work. Actually, you're developing workflows with a business to say, we have a forecast that in theory, we could actually update each month. We could add in May actuals and restart the whole thing again from the 1st of June. Change it very quickly in theory, it could take two hours. Mm. So actually a business every month when it says, what's our runway? something may have changed. So we don't just want to look at, you know, Jan to April actuals on an old budget and take an old cash flow position from May onwards. We just restart it. So the mindset is that you can get into people's diaries quicker and easier to solve these things quicker, which means that when you turn up at a board meeting, you can have your budget cash flow line, but you can say we've restarted it again and again yeah. and again and again. And you feel like everybody from a CEO or co-founders or board just um, I'm not saying are less panicky but you can actually have everyone very much objective and in the room with three months runway the but if you were guessing is it two is it four is the next month we just don't know you yeah. can feel like stress levels are up enough and actually it means when you've got a lot of brain power together i mean i joke with people that all the startups i work with technically could be busted out of money in quite a short period of time, not a lot of them do because you feel like they're focused on solving a problem and that's what they're really good at doing. So if they need to get capital, what's the right capital, how much? But the workflows that sit behind it isn't just a big piece of work that's out of date too quickly. You're trying mm. to keep this continuous, continuous presence. So personally, selfishly, I don't have big peaks and spikes of work and troughs it's as continuous as, as we can hold it to have a continuous presence to keep those, I suppose, processes in place. Yeah. But for the board and leadership and investors to also feel, um, if you picture on a, if you've got a 90 day rolling view forward, well, at least we've got 90 days of something needing our attention. It doesn't mean that it happens next Monday, we've got a problem because we have this, this nice shifting window because it's not stop start. Because you're using the right way of building the model or using the right outsourced technology, um, it's insightful and scalable to the founder and therefore it can be continual without needing to be majorly changed. So if we take, I, I'm assuming if you take runway and cash burn, yeah. um, for instance, once that has been built, it can be easily tweaked. So if on Slack, I'm the founder and I've got six months burn rate um, before the next raise, obviously I should already be thinking about raising, but, and I want you know, three customer success hires, yep. I could ping you on Slack and say, these are the base, these are the salaries that we would like to make an offer. And then quite you know, quickly with the model, yep. you can offer, I guess, consequences and opportunities that you see from those hires. Is that almost how the relationship could work? Yeah, it could be even easier. So the upskilling is that there's not a barrier to touching an Excel file or a Google file. That they will the, be scared though, some of them initially, surely. Yeah, no, of course. And this is the upskilling bit that every CEO needs to realize is that if you're going to work with finance person, lawyers, commercial people, whatever skills that you don't have, is that you're working with people that help you build that knowledge. I think that's, that's crucial. And, yeah. and we're blessed at a time now that you know, lawyers, I'm not saying they will bill you every six minutes or FDs will bill you every day or every you know, on some sort of recurring basis, but it, you've just got to be creative and you've got to try and find ways to, it doesn't take necessarily two hours to do something mm. that you can do yourself, like just as an example on the forecasting, they know where the file is, they can create a version. I mean, even just now this morning, um, a client who can just go in, make the changes. I mean, all the cells that he changes will be just colored pink and we can just go through it literally probably 30 minutes tomorrow just to confirm a he hasn't broken it but b is that are these changes commercially sound reasonable and what's the impact yeah and in a nice way when when you know further down the track the cells don't need to be pink because they can make changes knowing the inputs that they're making just flow all the way through see the impact on cash flow for example and just see or maybe runway correlated with something else. Now, step one is they might be so scared to touch an Excel file, but yeah, but you work towards on a progression basis, almost to a point that they could be talking an investor through, share the screen, open the forecast, make a change, not nervous about it, and the FD is not in the room. 
I mean, that from, from a VC or from an angel perspective, if you're sat with a founder and they are being open and visible and uh, confident to edit, change, model projections in front of you, I mean, it's just a brilliant sign, isn't it, in terms of comfortability? Great. Yeah, I mean, as, as an example, you know, an Excel can be a bit of a beast. To some people, one tab might be a beast. Try and, you try and literally shrink it as practically as you can. But even if, if it's, you can turn you know, three or four tabs of an Excel file into a PDF and the investor can receive and go through with the CEO a PDF that's nicely formatted, 90% of the content you know, of a forecast just has to underpin the story, like the rest of the pitch deck. The rest of it is just technical stuff. So I'd say, you know, I've got a founder, she makes, um, produces or commissions TV comedy series. So numbers, Excel, forecasting is not her comfort zone at all. But she just needs to be able to identify and explain a PDF, how it underpins the rest of the pitch deck of attracting talent, you know, seeking commissions or projects or development projects, the economics of developing those projects and investing in them. And then if you get one away or two away, you have a very interesting business. Now, if the, inv if the investor says, well, what about, I don't know, national insurance on headcount or something, or, I mean, I'd, I wouldn't expect her to answer that question, but she can just say, look, I'll go through, give me those questions and my FD's gonna answer yeah. them. It does take literally 15 minutes to just clear some of this Q and A. Now the investor will just understand that there's a, there is a line where the CEO is not the FD. Yeah. And the FD can just answer a simple question. Like, is it a timing issue? We've talked about revenue recognition before. It can just be complex accounting, but at least the investors heard 90% from the founder who they're investing in, and they see a financial output that is more mature than they would normally expect for an early stage business. Yeah, yeah. You're just ticking these boxes. It's just so much more sophisticated, isn't it, in terms of from a, a view as an extra on a party looking at what you're doing. What are you doing with FinOps and kind of controllership and outsource relationships? Um, how much of a priority is that? I'm assuming it's dependent on the industry sector and how many transactions are going on. Yeah, what's your, your play on that? Yeah, there's, so the business I tend to work with would probably have no full-time staff, fi finance staff. So yep. the finance function is most probably some of my time and some bookkeeping time. The yeah. bookkeeping time can vary, but I would say at its most is probably four days a month. So, we, and biggest business doing that is maybe say 10 mil turnover. So it's because the sim, the super lean for it can be, mil, yeah. uh, but, but that's because the systems behind it, I'll just give you an example without getting too techy and complex. If, if you kind of group and bulk transactions into a certain process, like for example, a business that's doing 10,000 transactions a month, there's a way of creating a cluster shambles in your P&L where it can take a lot of bookkeeping time to tidy it up. But you just develop methodologies where the bulk happens, for example, on Shopify, or the bulk happens on an Excel file, or the bulk happens through Stripe, and there's just one clean and simple transaction hitting the P&L. So you can end up with high volume, low accounting, rather yeah. than, we live in a world of automation, which is fantastic for, you know, putting certain things into the P&L in certain ways, I totally get it. But you want to semi-automate your business that from a control point of view, the transactions are all happening super cleanly, super quick, but the accounting behind it, whether it's the bookkeeper or the FD, is minimized. And it does mean that actually your first hire for your first kind of FP&A role or your first finance manager, um, maybe is pushed back two or three years. But yeah. actually, if, if you do need to bring them in sooner, you're doing it from a more sensible workflow point mm. of view, rather than thinking it's chaotic again, we need an extra second head. So an example was, I've got a business that's in the travel sector, turnovers maybe say four mil, full-time kind of finance admin person on the payroll, in the office, that's the culture. And my solution was to bring in a bookkeeper, I think she might be 14, 15 hours a month. So less than half the time, but a better forecast, better cash flow forecasting, better response rate, and yeah. that the you've rechipped the founders or the senior team to thinking, we never thought you could do this without having somebody physically here in the office on payroll full time. Mm. So sometimes the challenge for the business owners or the founders or the leadership is actually just 
think outside the box. Be creative. I mean, they're creative people anyway. And the finance, the whole finance sector, finance sector has actually woken up. I think like it's not pioneering to be a virtual FD. No, it's brilliant it, now it's, because it's just don't solve the problem or yeah. don't over engineer the problem. And I think that's it's great to see. Not just look personally, I'm I'm not just you are a little myself, biased. <laughs> but I love I love seeing other financial professionals who've been FDing full time roles in a nice way, get their life back, be creative, because they realize the service they provide can happen like one, two, three, four, five, build your portfolio of businesses, but you'll build a portfolio on the back of lean, agile workflows, not by coming in and over-engineering what you did in your last job, because then you're at capacity. And in a nice way as well, I, I mean, I know I bring my skills, but I'm learning all the time from creative, creative people so it's a mm. it's totally two-way I would not be doing what I do today if I hadn't been working with you know people who are very ambitious sales wise already kind of pushed and sold and you're the one feeling you're stopping the business over trading or you got technology people who you're the counselor although I'm not the sales director I've seen other businesses solve this problem and you can you can give non-financial counsel as to what you think is the next step you're in this you're in this fantastic world but it's it's not just because i'm acca and have done some exams and worked in a finance function or you know the corporate space it's actually i'm picking up what works and what doesn't work for for early stage companies yeah i think the thing that's fascinating for founders and useful for founders is that you know we we run a, a cfo program to help people become impactful cfos and um, the first foundation element of an impactful CFO covers controllership, FP&A, month yeah. end, FinOps. The second pro proportion covers strategic business partnering, catalyst for change, yeah. uh, maybe some driving, some uh, milestones, whether it's fundraising and M&A. And then the final third is all around um, leadership, being that level five leader, um, being able to own big uh, you know, kind of exit processes or, or kind of fundraising processes and just being that, uh, having the confidence of the soft skills to be able to influence, yeah. use the data and your commercial insight of that sector to drive the decision making of the board. Yeah. Now for a, a business that's got 10 staff and is 800,000 turnover or 2 million turnover and it's seed or pre-seed, yeah. um, they clearly can't get an impactful CFO full time. Um, and therefore they'll spend a certain amount of money for a, f a finance manager and then they will get you know, month end good um, and payments will be on time and your bank account will have money in it. But actually you don't have the benefits of the impactful CFO, which is using data to drive commercial insights, being the face and leader of the business. So people think, wow, this person's linked to my business. Yeah. Um, investors can be impressed with having someone that can... Uh, lead the fundraise or an exit process but the beauty with the portfolio cfo piece is that they they naturally aren't needed as many hours or days as a, a larger business because of the nature of the business but they can still have that high level strategic guidance yeah it's great i mean i think the the sector is open to that you know the the if they're successful in that early stage they just will purely because the size of the organization will need a full-time yeah. CFO. And the CFO in a, in a, I say a medium, medium-sized business that's doing say 20 mil turnover or wants to go to a much higher, you know, much higher end game. There's definitely value of recruiting a CFO from within a sector who almost will help with that series B, series C. Also brings an established, they will probably already have presence in that sector so they they are well known they've got a great track record and just them being on board can not just fit with the management team and the plan but they're a driving force of the plan now i'm just in the far earlier stages of that that to me that's success i love ending with a client where i'm being replaced by somebody from within that sector because mm. I'm not in this uh, forever for one business. It's almost like I've got, I'm totally comfortable within the kind of the, the, the phase of a business that I'm taking from, we have a problem, we don't need somebody full time, but if we're successful, maybe we do. And, and it's a great handover position because the inbound or the incoming C, CFO, 
probably wants to get an idea or do their due diligence on a business and they say, is this, is this okay? Like, what am I getting involved with? Yeah, you, could yeah. have, you could have 50, 70 employees. You could have a real, um, um, yeah, just not saying tricky P&L, but an inbound CFO, an incoming CFO would probably want to just have an idea. And you get just a refreshing level of, well, we've got happy, stable CXOs. Investors are, we can see the management reporting. And you can just see instantly that they're thinking, okay, they can come in and focus on that planned growth. They don't have to come in and sort out the other stuff. Well, access to timely, accurate, up-to-date information for a CFO, because there's a portfolio of CFO before, before, is you know, is a is a it's a given for a Series B, Series C CFO to take that gamble totally. unless um, they've given that they've been given access to the data room to do their digging um, in a lot of detail, but. You know, clearly it's more impressive because a CFO choosing which founder to join at a Series B stage will have options and yeah. they will want to go for a founder that chooses finance as a priority yeah. um, and sees it as a, an impactful decision-making tool as a po- opposed to some businesses that, that always consider finance potentially as a bit of a, a back office function and don't leverage it to the benefits they can. So. You know, CFOs we know, and also the VPs that are looking to step up, they are really looking for founders that they want to be a co-pilot with them yeah. on this journey. So an example of someone that's already been acting as a co-pilot with a portfolio specialist just makes sense. I'll give you a great example. I worked with a business where they thought when they started up, it was a hundred million pound business. And they got further down the track where it was when they, um, within their particular sector, there was a lot of private equity money, very fragmented market. This private equity money was just buying up small players in the market and consolidating them all under one brand. And what was quite interesting is when they got to a point where just say profits were around about one mil and they got an exit of around about six, seven mil. So I say six, seven times profit. But naturally, in, in every sector, there's always a bit of a spread, somewhere between two and six, maybe, for this particular sector. Other sectors with maybe a bit more blue chip and a different customer and a different customer value and a different um, stickiness, maybe, might have a multiple of 25 times profit. But in this particular space, it was two to six. And I think there was a sense of def- slight deflation when they sold, because it's quite a tiring process to sell a business. Yeah. But that's, this is the end game. So this is what you started up and did all this graft for. And there was a sense of, well, look, the deal's done. We're, we're, they were content and happy with the deal, but there was a sense of just fatigue. And it was only afterwards that they were comparing notes with another acquisition this private equity had done, bought a much bigger competitor, and they didn't have the, the, the same profitability, and they didn't get anywhere near six times profit. I think they might have got from memory between two and three, maybe two and a half times. So when you, we're going through all the numbers here, but it ended up when I was thinking, oh my goodness, so you've got got six times profits. You've actually sold your business for double what they've sold. So they're a bigger competitor, been in the market for longer. Mm. They didn't have the systems. Now, the CFO doesn't do all the systems, but they didn't have the systems, the streamlining, the ownership of acquisition costs, the ownership of the cost base, the focus on profits. And then, yeah, the finance deck and the PDFs and all the, as you said, the kind of the management accounts that gives you that confidence. So you end up with suddenly like an exhilaration thinking, well, we got, of all the acquisitions, the highest that they paid to acquire that business based on its profitability. And if you'd done this other business had sold for the same level and had actually got their profitability to the same, I say, percentage of turnover, they've left like 28 20 million behind, 18, 20 million. So that's quite a painful lesson to have sold your business at some point mm. and then have someone like me come along with a fag packet and say, I think, you've, I think if you had got your stuff together <laughs> and had been more organized and more on top of things, whether it was process, tech, automation, something, as well as the other things like you are more attractive acquisition, they might not have bought you for 20 million. Yeah. But that's the value that you would have been putting on your business. So if they paid two, I mean, I think they've basically just acquired a customer base and just strip everything else mm-hmm. out because there's no value there. 
but you've left 18 behind. Yeah. And it's, it's a real powerful lesson for any founder watching just to understand that you, when you sell a business, it doesn't happen just one month before you sell your business. You have to have the mindset that it starts today. So in three years time, if someone says, give me 36 months of management accounts, you're literally just dragging 36 PDFs into a data yeah. room and go, here they are. Not, right, we better start doing management accounts. It's a bit late for Can that. anyone PDF <laughs> a spreadsheet? It's so late, it's over. And that's what the happened to these guys is that they were probably fatigued thinking, well, this is the only offer that's gonna come along. Maybe it's a good thing for us. You know, I need to either sort my personal finances out at yeah. the same time. Someone waves two mil at you and your founders and you say, well, I mean, it sounds like it's a big number, but what you've missed is, what could you have won? Mm. And you can't wind back the clock. You can't do any of these things. So it's a good due diligence for founders to actually be self-reflective of yeah. CFO or otherwise. You're just making a contribution to a culture which is, can anyone else see what it's costing to acquire a customer? And if they don't stick around for this long, we're not even covering the cost of the acquisition. So start fixing a few things make it colorful, make it creative, but we, we need to fix these things so when we do attract attention, or as you said, raise money, we're raising it from a position of strength of we know our customer economics, because we, as you said, because we track them. We know what it costs to acquire a customer because we track it. Mm. So we're not left with... How many of the founders that you first meet have the relevant metrics that are driving performance in the business or the relevant OKRs that are driving the I would, performance in I would say they're, they are, I mean, I would see them as investable. Okay. Just not necessarily structured or maybe OCD about it. Some would, okay. be, some would be very OCD about certain statistics and have great energy. So they would have some of it. They might not have, I mean, there's a bit of fatigue of, you know, revenue is vanity, profit sanity, cash flow is reality. So they might, they might be really strong on some of those metrics maybe just not as maybe the word is balanced as a scorecard so they could be very strong on the ones they want to share and you're trying to flush out what what other ones should be on the list are any i'm assuming some are still managing their accounts and their performance of the business based on what's in the bank account or is it i'd hope not but uh yeah i've I, heard i've heard that can be the case oh yeah so. you can have people i mean we'll look at a bank balance and say, well, it's okay, we've got 450 grand in the bank. And as an accountant, you'll start to go white in the face <laughs> because you've got a balance sheet. So it's not just the bank balance, who owes us, who do we owe? So now we're into the world of what does the next six to nine months look like? Yeah. So they might've been in that mindset when I first started working with them. And th then this, this becomes the bigger opportunity, which is trying to influence more and more people, not just the ones you work with, it's not just about your bank balance. That's just a number. I'm more interested on, so if you had 30 grand in the bank or 430, I'd still like to know what's the runway. Like, are you profitable? Are customers paying you? Is it efficient? You know, I mean, I've seen people who've got four, you know, healthy bank balances, but they're not billing their customers. It's, so they've, they've got a very profitable P&L and some money in the bank, but it's like your billing cycle is just not efficient. You're not billing people. Do they know that you've done the work? So you end up that you just got, when you, when you get involved, you just got big, I say provisions or big kind of accrued income. And you just, in very simple terms, you can say, right, it's gotta go from that box of accrued income to the debtor. <laughs> so you've invoiced them and we wanna empty that into the bank account. Mm. That's gotta happen for the money to be in your bank account. Yeah. So you kind of shift them off the bank balance quite quickly into, so startups raising money know the bank balance is going to go down. What you're trying to do is to hopefully be able to raise more capital or be cash positive before you run out of money. So it's never about the bank. The bank balance is a starting point on the graph, but it, it's actually what's, what's going to happen over the next 30, 60, 90 days. What does a founder need to do or be like or appreciate to get the best out of a portfolio CFO, do you think? Oh, great question. I think it's a two-way relationship. So they can't, the FD, my style is not to be a subservient FD. Do this, do that. Have you done it? It's a working relationship. And my, my role up to them is 
is not to just be bombarding them with the wrong information, the wrong stats. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very much a two-way thing. They, yeah, I, I totally respect where they're coming from. And if there's gaps, I need to fill them. And if there's an understanding or misunderstanding, we need to work through it. And then the flip side as a role is for me to say, well, this is, is this 10 days work? There's a, there's a huge element of trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't say, yeah, I did 10 days work. So I'm going to bill you for 10 days. So the, the role and relationship is totally two way. And also from a billing point of view that you're not never setting out to give someone bill shock. They can see that there's a value attachment to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And without sounding defensive, there's, an, there's almost like the mindset of the FD is to, is to not become overhead. So I've been in businesses where I'm thinking, this is two to three days a month of my time. I am running my own business as such, but I can't be billing for this. So now you're kind of into the second phase of mm. when it's not working out, how yeah. do you, you still want to support the business, you still want them to see them succeed, but you're becoming overhead because the business isn't growing or because certain dynamics or the, maybe the product market fit isn't right and it's not happening and there's other pain points and you're just accounting for the pain points rather than being in a business where stuff is going up and revenues are going up and traction is there and it presents a different challenge for a CFO. So you get that, you get that mix, comes down to two way and it comes down to trust. So if you're a CEO or a founder like watching and you think, well, what's the first step I take? You should be in a conversation with somebody where you're not recruiting an employee. It's not a full-time role and you've got the right to be able to just learn from, from the FD. If they're not teaching you and upskilling you, I think you're gonna be left with someone working with you for six months and at the end yeah. of that six month tenure, someone asked you a simple question and yeah. you go, I don't know. Like, I'm yeah. back to looking at my bank balance again. Yeah, yeah. And when you you like trying to leave a legacy, so you want you know you've already mentioned this. You, you know you've got a handover at some point, and actually you want the handover because it means the business is moving in the right direction, right? Um, yeah. Um, you know, a, a business that raises the Series A, you're, you've raised the Series A, but it gets to a stage that hopefully um, they've got the the cash to make investments to scale, and depending on that level of you know, rocket speed growth. Um, What's your suggestions around what the finance leader should look like? Um, Before then or after then? Afterwards, when, you, when you're, yeah, I guess you're, you know you're gonna move on at, at some point, yeah. know, pre you know, going into a series B or actually you know, they're looking at international growth or they're starting to go from you know, two million ARR to 15 million in the next 12, 18 months. You know, what are you considering? And, and do you have those conversations with founders about what they should yes. do? Yeah, another good question. I, I, I guess I built a relationship with founders and it could, you might think when you start off, it's just six months, six months, maybe a year and something big is going to happen or two years. Mm. You could be working with them for four years. And over that period, although I'm kind of virtual, you know, alongside running the business are people, you know, families, kids, COVID, pets, school runs, family stuff. So you end up being kind of you're living parallel lives yeah. as well as being an advisor. The main thing I would kind of advise or I would kind of flag is things do change when you bring in a VC. Things do change if you bring in the right angel investor or the wrong angel investor. It can change the culture. And it's similarly when you bring in a CFO, if you're selecting one, which they do, so they come to you and say, right, we need a full time CFO. My biggest counsel would be is that you want to almost embrace that process as I need to understand this person because you've had this part-time FD for four years and what you've got now is you've, you've now got a full-time role of someone who will want to make their mark in their way and they've got maybe a completely different mm. structure, brand, culture and again you just have a two-way relationship where the, the CEO or founders need to just be ready for that cultural shift. I don't think it comes as a shock from my, from my experience, it hasn't been a cultural shock. But an example would be a business I worked with, two founders, but say a senior team of say five people, bought by a much bigger player in the industry, and now the, the acquiring company is the finance function. So I do a handover to their yeah. senior team, yeah. bookkeeper does a handover, because they just don't need us. 
all comes together quite nicely. So now the founders have to deal with the finance function, which I'm not knocking the finance function of a big company, but it's just a finance function of a big company. It's different, isn't it? The fluidity, they've got better practices in some respect, better reporting deadlines, like it's day two and day three. We weren't ever, we're never gonna be day two, day, day two or day three continuously for a business. There has to be a bit of ebb, ebb and flow, but things change because you've gone from two flexible bookkeeper FD, reachable, contactable, to just a big finance function that culturally has to behave in a different way. Not criticism, but just has to, otherwise yeah. it's got chaos because you're now seeing your business into something else. So if you had a question, you could ping the FD. You might just not get the same response from a group CFO. Yeah, yeah. Or it could be an example of where good governance, which is, I'm not saying founders will put personal spend through the business, but you can see that the governance changes. So you can't just do what you thought you could do. Yeah. You actually, you're now part of a much bigger entity. So there's different rules for approval of new suppliers, you know, raising, I say, any sort of financial transaction that you may have had just more flexibility for how you did it. You've got to follow someone else's rules. With um, your beach talks, which obviously I've been following, and I know they've been brilliant for founders of uh, getting good uh, interaction um, on LinkedIn and things. What's your what's your aim with that? Because I know you've got you know future plans to maybe spin that off and make it you know, slightly more in depth for founders or for FDs to to kind of utilise. Yeah, the beach talks were again probably just be an infectious part of working with people who everyone's got a story. I think, personally, I think we're in a world now where founders are obviously telling their story and growing their business and they become very good at or more resilient to telling their story. And it has just rubbed off on me that I've thought for a long time, you know, I work with a portfolio of businesses, but actually, you know, more pressingly, there are thousands and thousands of businesses being set up every day. I mean, mm. since COVID now, I mean, COVID is what, two, two and a quarter years ago we're probably close to almost a million new businesses have been created since That's I say nuts. January, 2020. Now, That's a lot crazy. of those would be one person or two person, but a lot of companies I've worked with started as a two person entity and then realized they got something good going and, and can grow from there. So the peach talks was kind of a mix of feeling. I've got some anecdotes. My kids are doing ballet. I've got an hour to kill. I might as well just record something on a beach and most importantly, try and make it interesting for someone to listen to. Because, you know, if someone's going to watch something and if it's four minutes, I totally respect that someone's giving me four minutes of their time to watch it. So I thought as a foreman, I would just do it. And I've done almost 50 now. Wow. And I've, we're in the space of trying to find a common ground with a founder or, or business owner who, yeah, finance is quite a dry subject. But within that subject, hopefully there are pockets of stories or not straight direct finance but that just experiences of me working with early stage companies that have just come across try and condense into three or four minutes however i do feel like we're in the space of i think the next five ten years for me personally are to try and continue to influence a wider number of people because when you are on a small island like the isle of Wight, i mean i, I lived in london for 15 years so you see the the smaller I don't say rural, but that smaller kind of out of city environment, as well as the starting up a company, starting up a business in London, there is an element of, if you can get a number of businesses through that early stage phase where they have recruited their fifth person, I mean, you're into some interesting numbers of mm. a lot, you know, you can't help everybody. Someone's gonna fail, but if you can get more and more of those to just come through that, they don't have to win the Super Bowl, but if they can see a positive return for the risk they put into what they started with as an idea and have been encouraged to take step after step after step. Some of it's, some of it's finance, but as we've talked about, the CFO role is not just accounting for what you did last year, it's trying to get business owners to look forward. Is that finance or not? It's kind of finance, but actually a lot of it is just driving positive action, mm. sharing knowledge, trying to just encourage people to, I don't want to say fail and fail fast, but just to go with the flow and the, the ups and downs and ebbs and flows of trying to start a company. And yeah, if you can see, I mean, if you got a thousand of those to get to 
that fifth employee, you've got you've got a business and you've got employment and you've got that next that next stage. But you've got a lot of you know sustainable little businesses, and some may take off more than they ever thought, and some may have been Fantastic. aggressively trying to take off anyway. But I think, and the market I think is coming towards that. Yeah. You don't you don't need to create a two hundred fifty person company for it to be a success. You can have. 10 people in a business. I mean, I don't say Instagram as you're obvious, but you can, you got people to write, like genuinely write a number on a page that they're, they would be happy with to live a life that they're happy with. It's not a seven figure sum. Mm. So for the risk that they're taking, there's two traps. People sometimes start a business where it will never pay back because they're not growing the right business, the right opportunity. So if you, if you divided the time by the number of years and the number of hours they're putting in, they're paying themselves below minimum wage effectively for, for what they're doing. Mm. And then the risk they're taking also has no return. That's one side. And then you've got other people that they've got so much upside that if they were happy with, for example, 100,000 as an, as an outcome, or these guys that sold their business for six mil and were c totally content with that exit, they probably, although they were, they were, you know, on day one saying 100 mil sounds like a nice number, they don't need 100 mil. They don't need six mil. The number that they need would be much smaller. So if you help a business grow to that level as an early stage, purely early stage business, and I appreciate we're in a difficult economic climate right now. Yeah, you can see guiding people early stage and helping more them through that early stage challenge shall we say, where there is a high dropout rate for different reasons. How can you scale your support then? Obviously, there's only a certain number of companies that you can support yourself individually, but is there something that you can build or you've built that can help founders get a bit more insight into the fundamentals? Yeah, so a classic would be the, the journey I've got now is I've got this product called Own Your Numbers, which is effectively a dashboard, and it condenses a business onto, I say, a page, two pages and people can just see what's going on. Yeah, okay. And I think wow. it's, it's, a, it's a, a first level step into, if I'm running a business and I can't see anything, either the answer's on the page or you've got a lot of blanks to look at. And that starts to get you focused on, I need to know, I need to have something to look at. Yeah. And that's kind of step one for me is that it, it would probably identify 80%, 90% of the issues you need to fix to feel like you're on top of things and also spend less time thinking about numbers, more time growing your business. So that's, I would say that's the kind of the scalable funnel if you kind of picture it at the mm. top of trying to help a much wider number of people. So someone could watch a beach talk and then just go, I'm gonna make a change. And that's a positive, yep. drives positive behavior. The dashboard is a bit more, I would say analytical. I don't need 20 FDs to produce dashboards. You just need an analyst to produce a dashboard but the output feels very FD friendly. And then as a business kind of grows and does need an FD, whether it's part-time or full-time, they really have progressed to the point to needing one. But what you're trying to do is not just scale as an FD practice. I much prefer working with the C CEOs myself and the founders, but the, the appetite is when you're in the space, say working with 10 at any one time, is could you still influence a much wider number of people who right now are trying to run and grow a business yeah. right now? They might have accountants, which is fine, but they, accountants will, by and large will tell you what you did last year. They just need to be reminded to be looking forward. Yeah. And they need something that is a bit more visual than just the default P&L that comes off zero. That is too much numbers for a non-financial person to be trying to figure out and understand. Most of the audience are founders, but there's also a lot that we watch in this that are actually VP of finance, CFOs, portfolio CFOs. So, I mean, this is probably more for them, but also it's useful for founders to, to think about. Um, what should they be doing or considering when they meet founders and are assessing whether that business is the right step for them? Yeah, great question. I think, I think there's an element of before you engage with a business, so if I'm an FD and a CEO wants to meet with me, without saying I'm an expert in the law of attraction, you've got to be pretty clear that the content you're producing or the subjects you talk about or how you present yourself 
will ultimately attract the people you want to deal with. Mm -hmm. So there's no written rules to how that exactly works. But if you want to attract disasters, it's no surprising if the only people who are coming towards you are disasters. You've got no ability to actually maybe enjoy your role because it's just tough. You might not be able to expand to the five you want to split your time over because you're just tied up in one. But so there's an element of, for example, if I wanted to attract 20 businesses, I would obviously have to work on my proposition that I could support 20 at any one time. You make it clear in your conversation that if they've got a problem that's too big for you in your portfolio, it's just not for you. And the world, the connecting world we're in is that you can just try and refer them to somebody who can solve the problem. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's really down to the FD to decide on first and foremost, what type of business do you like working with? Like literally, can you picture, I know we talk about it often, but can you picture the person you want to attract? And if you can, you've got to start talking to them in the content you put out, whether it's by sector, whether it's to a specific kind of person, makes it a lot easier. And don't be surprised you, excuse me, don't be surprised you will attract them. Mm. It's quite amazing. And, and LinkedIn is an amazing platform as well, where you might see that you've got some great CFOs, but there it feels like a CV. And CEOs and founders aren't in the mood for CV it's changed checking. So much. That mar it, the market really, I think, is just archived now, yeah. which actually opens the door to just being you being authentic and by doing so you will attract people who you are trying to attract but you can make it easy for yourself yeah. does that answer the question no it does. i mean i think it does i think you know the way that um people's personal brand as a cfo represents themselves is light years away from what it was 10 years ago obviously i was in recruitment for finance leaders before linkedin was around which is quite scary and you were doing it by calling out who were calling up to work out who was in which roles and and uh you know faxing cvs or whatever but well, it's i mean scary what, times what i find interesting again i'm always learning is that in your role you are trying to find the right fit cfo or cfo candidates for a particular client and what you've done in the background already is you've already figured out who this particular ceo or business is yeah and you're trying to put the right people so your personal brand is on the line of doing both sides of who is maybe not 100% right, but you feel is a good fit to put them in front of each other. Mm. I, the thing that's interesting for us is that obviously the purpose of our business is to find a CFO, VP of finance, that's going to make a tangible difference for the founder and the business and help them hit their milestone. Yeah. But also we've got a, a, a responsibility to place a CFO into a role and a purpose to place a CFO into a role that they enjoy being in every day and yeah. um, we get that right the vast amount of times but you, you don't know the data that the finance business actually has and sometimes a CFO who hasn't got the full picture comes in yeah. and it's not as accurate or, or not quite as they thought it was going to be so I, I think you're dealing with always remember as well we're dealing with humans so until they're in that environment so I, I say jokingly but it's a serious point when I meet with somebody for the first time and we agree maybe at the end of the first meeting whether we let's do this let's make it happen it can work I can fix this problem all that stuff but I do joke that I'm not the right fit for every business yeah. or every person and also they're not necessarily going to be always the right fit for you know every situation mm -hmm. so at least if we're, we're kind of we're grown-ups and we're adults that if for whatever reason in one month time, six months, two years, I'm not the right fit. Like the obvious bit is we need a full-time CFO. But just say there's a personality or as you said, yeah. the numbers aren't there or the business isn't going well or I'm just becoming overhead or something. It's so nice to have the conversation right at the start. And I don't know when I started saying this, but further down the track, you could be one client I would say with four years and it was like I've just got fatigue it's just not happening the products and going nowhere and there's a bit of a kind of a moral I, I feel like I'm morally involved or involved in this business to say I don't feel comfortable that we're spending other people's money and raising money the way the way it was all going and I'm going to walk away and it's okay I'm going to do it in a smooth and controlled yeah, way yeah. but do you remember you know Four years ago, we did have this conversation 
So it feels like the pressure's off me and the pressure's definitely off the CEO as well. Mm. When you have this conversation up front, which is like, obviously, if it's not working out. But I see FDs as well in businesses for far too long than they should be. And they have got bogged down and they are fatigued. And it's the environment or the sector or the numbers or something. And they just need to find a business that's a better fit. Yeah. You know, one that you enjoy. We're, we're quite blessed with a skill set that if you love sport, how many sports businesses could you be working with right now? Music, yeah. arts. If you like making specific plastic widgets, there's businesses out there that manufacture them. So yeah. whatever your kicks, you can probably find a sector or a business that you turn up feeling energized, wanting to make a difference, as you said, want to grow the business, but you enjoy the process of going through it rather than resentment or not enjoying it. Most so. of the, the founders we obviously support are looking for a, you know, a, a super impactful CFO. So someone who's been at you know, one business for 10 years, what we're looking for is progression, either in terms of responsibility or variety of key milestones that they've been involved in to yeah. demonstrate they can be nimble and they've thrived and they've made a difference. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's very difficult if there is that, lege that, that longevity in one company with no big changes going on to highlight their suitability for a high impact, fast paced, you know, series B, series C business. I mean, the things that we do, I guess when we first meet people after the first screening call is assessing the career logic. So does okay. this logically make right for this candidate? Because if it does, they're more likely to be there in two years, three years time. If it doesn't, then when a better offer comes along, they will move. Yeah. Do the skills and experiences fit the key ones that the client needs? So if there's a list of 10, we need to choose the top four yeah. and prioritize them because you're not going to get every, every list. But if you can have the top four in order and individual hits three of them, and then the third part is they have the cultural fit and the yeah. culture add, yeah. and there's going to be bouncing ideas off each other as a co-pilot, then you're in a good place. I'd love um, to have done that assessment 12 years ago. Yeah, well... Because what I'm curious is that I was in the corporate space, mobile phone, broadband, huge numbers, like business cases were you know, 500 mil, a billion, UK was six billion. I mean, so decent numbers, complex models. As I described, just like a mega corp mindset, make everything so complicated, make it massive. Cause you to, in a way you to justify your existence. And then you, you step out of that space and I see, I figured, I figured all this out, I say by myself, I figured the finance bit out by myself, but I was hugely influenced by mates who were starting up businesses. And I was coming in with, oh, these amazing models, too complex, too big, too, you know, I mean, I, I, I kind of joke about the fag pack of model, but you can actually have a credible forecast with yeah. four or five rows in it because you've got real actuals that are real good benchmarks and you can simplify I say a complex production process because you've got great margins and great profit percentages. But I came out of the corporate space with figuring this stuff out myself, like the finance role. I didn't talk to, but I was, I was surrounding myself with business owners. So if I was back there 12 years ago, I'd be so curious to have done, it, done that exercise because I think it probably would have confirmed yeah. what is the right fit. What sectors are the right fit? Like, the the city is full of people who shouldn't be working in the city. There are, you know, there are people. I say, I mean, I'm 47. There are people who are getting to, you know, phases of their career where they've got huge expertise. But the way I would describe it is, is that work should be finding them because the content they produce and the the people that they attract, rather than them applying for a role. Yeah. But there's a middle ground which is from your mid thirties or your early thirties where you are thinking, okay, FC, FD roles, CFO roles, can I step up? What do I need, as you said, to go through and get, keep that momentum going because everyone's gonna look at me and my track record and saying, what's the last role? What have you achieved? The previous roles, everyone wants that kind of momentum and it's really important. But then you get to your mid forties thinking, well, you could still be working for another 20 years and actually, it's quite important to think about, don't be... You've got to enjoy the journey, haven't you? Standing on the train platform, going to roll, you're just yeah. sick of, but it's paying a lifestyle, but you're not enjoying it. You've got yo to yourself as a person, but also you can realize you can 
go through an assessment and it could be a rain check might feel like a knockback to say you're not the right person for these reasons, this role yeah. but it could open up a huge amount of opportunity for you in the process I so agree. so so i see a lot of people coming from or reaching out and connecting and say i want to do this portfolio fd thing and my first question to them is are you looking for like roles and relationships or are you looking for a job because it's not a job you're not getting a job you've got to sell yourself and you've got to build relationships which is a different mindset to saying there's a job off you go because that's their comfort zone is going in doing the job where startups i wouldn't classify as a job it's a role or it feels like something yeah, it's bigger than that or certain, you create it? it you almost want to stop doing pointless work and do do the stuff that has a point and has a value so it's a, it's yeah i'd, I'd have been so curious I thought I was going to have a midlife crisis <laughs> if I was in the corporate space when I was 45. Well, luckily, so I had a different assessment. Luckily you did told myself this. Well, look, thank you so much. Um, as I said, it was great to actually finally meet and take the time out. I know we're, we're talking next month and we'll continue to do so. But yeah, thank you very much again. And um, I hope that's useful to everyone that's watching. And um, yeah, see you soon. Cheers, Karen. Thank you. Cheers.